Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Embry. And I'm Janice. And the name of this program is Quick Study Television, a television program designed to take you through the Bible. That's the 66 books by the 40 authors, written over thousands of years, yet all with the same theme. Who is the theme? What is the theme? We'll talk about that later on. But right now, Corey's going to tell us what she's doing. Corey? Today I'm talking about another accidental discovery of a very important tomb. Very important tomb. I look forward to that. Now, do you have another question? I do. We have questions for the next few days, and this oh, is from man. Proverbs, so get ready. All right, so where is it? It's from Proverbs. We're going we're gonna to have to answer the question you from will. the kids. Mm. So it's, <laughs> All right, Ryan, you're going to be up. But what's up, Ryan? Well, today we're talking about the Big Bang Theory in the Bible. Can these two accounts be reconciled? All right, the Big Bang Theory in the Bible. Get your Bible out and your Bible guide out, and let's study as we get ready to hear from God. going to be jumping ahead to the time period of the New Testament for today. And we're going to be focusing in on yet another archaeological discovery that is adding to uh, the, the great uh, plethora of witnesses that we have to establish the time period of the New Testament, specifically uh, the lifetime of Jesus Christ. So establishing that historically and through the physical artifacts of archaeology. In 1990, an ancient tomb was accidentally discovered. Carved directly into Jerusalem's bedrock, it contained six intact ossuaries, or bone boxes, and six overturned and broken ossuaries, evidence of an ancient grave robbery that for whatever reason was never completed. This burial cave was originally accessed through a small entranceway. Once inside, a pit was dug into the floor to allow mourners to stand upright. The tomb features four loculi, long recesses first used to place a body for decomposition and later to house ossuaries where the bones of the deceased were collected and stored. Many of the ossuaries of this tomb were decorated with carved patterns. Five of the ossuaries bear name inscriptions, and two of these inscribed ossuaries caught the particular attention of archaeologists. Both were found still tucked away in one of the loculi, and both contain the Aramaic equivalent to the famous name Caiaphas. One of these ossuaries is decorated intricately on its front and lid and bears two longer inscriptions. Both read, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. In this ossuary, the remains of two infants, a two to five year old child, a teenage boy, an adult woman, and a man around 60 years old were found. This elderly man has become the topic of much discussion. In the New Testament, the high priest presiding over the interrogation of Jesus is referred to as Caiaphas. The writings of first century historian Josephus give a longer name for him, Joseph Caiaphas, and Joseph, who is called Caiaphas. It is possible to understand the inscription on this ossuary as meaning Joseph of the family of Caiaphas. There is a known lack of diversity in personal names during the Second Temple time period, so it's not surprising that many went by family names or nicknames. The inscriptions, an intricately designed box worthy of a one-time high priest, have led many scholars to the belief that this box houses the family and remains of New Testament Caiaphas. So this ossuary of Caiaphas and this family tomb of Caiaphas, it doesn't tell us much more than we already knew. It was already established through the Gospels and uh, through Roman historians like the first century AD historian Josephus. Uh, but what it does do is it just adds more physical artifacts uh, to the list of artifacts that came from the time of Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. Uh, and of course, Caiaphas, such a key figure in the gospel narratives, 
you know, uh, being the high priest and, uh, over the Sanhedrin uh, when Jesus Christ uh, is, is brought before the Sanhedrin and has his trial. So this is a really key figure in the whole gospel narratives and to have uh, this bone box uh, of him and, and to have uh, the, the family tomb exposed of Caiaphas is just so neat. Uh, now, there are, of course, many other artifacts from this time period as well. Uh, another very famous example, of, of course, is Pontius Pilate. We know of Pontius Pilate uh, from various uh, Roman historians, especially Josephus, uh, but we also have uh, an inscription, his name uh, carved uh, in stone, a, dedi a dedi dedication inscription, sorry about that, dedication inscription, found in Caesarea Maritima. Uh, so uh, here are two key figures who witnessed the trial of Jesus Christ, and we have physical remains from their lives. The Bible says it is better to be poor than perverse in lips. Now, swearing is a violation of the soul. But actually, we hurt the Lord when we lose control of our mouth. When our life is ruled by our mouth, we are governed by our words. Foolishness is a sin. What we say and how we say it is critical to what we believe and who we believe. Now, God listens intently to our words. Astoundingly, God's word says it is better to be poor than one perverse in his lips. We are called to control our mouth. God helps us to do this. We do not have the ability to control what we say or what we spew, but God helps us. Proverbs 19, verses 1 through 8. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he sins who hastens with his feet. The foolishness of a man twists his way, and his heart frets against the Lord. Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his friend. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. Many entreat the favor of the nobility, and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good. Proverbs chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. This, the scripture that we read today is so important and I cannot emphasize how important it is. So I'm just going to tell you, it is important. And we need to recognize that when Janice reads that scripture, we need to realize what is God saying to us? God is speaking to us every single day in this program. And as we hear the scripture, that's where the healing of God comes. So listen carefully to the scripture. If you have a Bible guide, get your Bible guide out. If not, you can get a hold of a Bible guide by writing to the one of three addresses that we have in the UK or in the United States or in Canada. Or you can also go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. When you go there, click on Donate Now and send an offering in any amount. We're not going to tell you how much. Just in whatever amount God says to you, some you know, send a dollar, some send a hundred dollars, some a thousand, doesn't matter. Whatever God speaks to you, do whatever He says. That's very, very important. But today, we're going to be looking at this now, and this is interesting. What do we say about this scripture? How do we communicate 
the whole FaithWorks program. And the best way to do this is to simply say, there are times when the Bible says, you know, I'm just going to tell you how it is. It's better that you're poor. What? Poor. Nobody wants to be poor. Everybody tries to be wealthy. Everybody tries to have some money. Nobody wants to be poor. But God is using this to compare it with something. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We're reading Proverbs chapter 18 to 20. Very important. As we read through this, 18 to 20 keeps us up with going through the Bible and looking at Proverbs chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. As we look at this, it's important for us to read it. So as we read it, listen carefully. Listen carefully. Proverbs 19, verses 1 and 2. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge and his sins who hastens with, feet, with his feet. That is very interesting. Money is not seen as an advancement in the kingdom of God. Money is not seen as an advancement in the kingdom of God. Successful people tend to be self-controlled people. Now, I can tell you this. It's very important. I know a number of people who are my friends. They're very wealthy. A number of people who are not my friend or who are my friends and they're not wealthy. And this is important because you see both of them. And you see all kinds of people. Everybody's striving to be rich. Everybody wants to win the lottery. You know, you get, did you get your lottery numbers in? Now, hold on a minute. Don't do that. My thinking is, Lord Jesus Christ, what do you want us to do? Because money is not seen as advancement in the kingdom of God. God gives money to people as he sees fit. God also supplies every single need. Need not want. You know, God supplies you with meals and food and everything you, you know, need, not the 60-inch television set you want, but everything you need. And it's important to recognize that. And so when we do that, we understand that money is not the advancement cycle. It's not the reason that God benefits us that changes the pace of many different things. Now we go on, chapter 19, verses three and four. The foolishness of a man twists his way and his heart frets against the Lord. Wow, I didn't know you could do that, but apparently you can. Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his friend. Are you serious? Wealth is not how we define our friendship, beloved. We, we must understand friendship is real without the wealth to assist it. And this is so important. I can tell you that there are people who have uh, much money in this world, and they have a lot of friends. There's always a lot of people around them. And a lot of people need them. They always know all the people who have the big nonprofit organizations who are trying to be with the people. And you see, that's so important. We have to understand that wealth has friends. But there are many who are not wealthy. They don't have those same friends. And so, beloved, we have to understand that money is wrapped around our culture. But money is not the advancement of God. Money has meant much friends, but money is not the way we define friendship. Very important that the Bible tells us this. We continue on. In reading the scripture, we learn something very important. Chapter 19, verses 5 through 8 says, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. He will not escape. Many people think they got away with it. No, he will not escape. It says, Many entreat the favor of the nobility. And every man is a friend of one who gives gifts. Of course he is. And the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. But he who gets wisdom loves his own soul. Now that's amazing. He who keeps understanding will find good. We are not to try to win friends. We're not to try to go out and get a bunch of people. 
What we are to do is seek the face of God for wisdom and understanding, and God will bring us friends. God brings people into our lives who we can fellowship with. I remember talking to someone who said, well, you know what? Uh, I'll tell you what, Rod, it's important that you understand this, but I don't have a lot of friends. Well, God's wisdom has nothing to do with our wealth and everything to do with our soul. Now, that's important. We must control ourselves through God's work. You see, he said, I don't have a lot of friends. But he's looking at friends for the wrong reason. You see, God gives us people that we can talk to, that we can bear our souls with, that we no probably normally would not do. And this is a whole new idea. But this is what God does in the church. God does this in the church. And God gives us people to talk to. He gives us assignment. See, we see ourselves as making our own friends and going, doing things. That's fine. But we need to remember that God is involved in our life and God is telling us and he's showing us who our friends are and who our friends are not. God knows who we will talk to. He knows who we won't. God knows what is best for us, beloved. We must remember that. Next time on Quick Study Television, we are going to be studying something interesting, promoting yourself. The Bible says not to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because not too many people are into not promoting themselves, especially with the selfie today. So we'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, here's Ryan. Many Christians attempt to mesh the Big Bang Theory and the Bible together. But as we discovered last week, these two origin stories are diametrically opposed. And there's a good reason for that. The Big Bang Theory was developed to explain the universe without God. So Bible believers should not accept this cosmology. Furthermore, today we're going to begin to see why even secular scientists are abandoning the Big Bang. Let's study. Due to the pressures of pop science, many Christians have attempted to mesh the Big Bang Theory with the Bible. However, the Big Bang Theory and the Bible clearly present diametrically opposing views about the origin of the universe and therefore should not be blended. Further, the Big Bang is a theory in crisis. Indeed, there are many scientific problems with this particular origin story, and Big Bang supporters are forced to accept, on blind faith, a number of notions that are completely inconsistent with real observational science. For example, particle physicists claim that many magnetic monopoles should have been created in the high temperature conditions of the Big Bang. A monopole is a hypothetical giant particle just like a magnet. However, as the name suggests, it only has one pole. Unfortunately for Big Bang enthusiasts, monopoles, though they would be stable enough to last to present day, have not been found anywhere. The fact that they are nowhere to be found suggests that the universe was never that hot. Another issue for the Big Bang is known as the flatness problem. Astrophysicist Dr. Jason Lyle explains, The expansion rate of the universe appears to be very finely balanced with the force of gravity. This condition is known as flat. If the universe were the accidental byproduct of a Big Bang, it is difficult to imagine how such a fantastic coincidence could occur. Big Bang cosmology cannot explain why the matter density of the universe isn't greater causing it to collapse upon itself, or less causing the universe to rapidly fly apart. The problem is even more severe when we extrapolate into the past. Since any deviation from perfect flatness tends to increase as time moves forward, it logically follows that the universe must have been even more precisely balanced in the past 
than it is today. With the laws of physics able to allow for an infinite range of values, this is statistically impossible. Though attempts have been made to solve the missing monopoles and flatness problems, such as inflation, this has been unsuccessful. Furthermore, even if inflation was able to solve these problems, there are many more issues with Big Bang cosmology, as will be soon explored. Therefore, it is wise if Bible believers do not adopt this extremely shaky theory. As I said before, the Big Bang is a theory in crisis. Today, we looked at just two of the many problems it has, and we'll look at two more next week. For these reasons, many scientists on both sides of the fence are completely abandoning it. Let's not try, then, to graph the Big Bang and the Bible together. May we let the Bible speak for itself. More next week. Yeah, that's really important again, Ryan, because I remember when they came up with the Big Bang Theory. Of course, that was back in the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody was, all the preachers were saying, well, see, that's what the Lord did. He did the Big Bang. And uh, that was a problem because it Not didn't work. Not all preachers. Not all mm -hmm. preachers, but a lot of preachers were. But that was the problem. And then we would adjust our teaching according to the science that was being brought out. The problem was, of course, that we had to adjust our teaching all the time because yeah. science mm -hmm. was changing. Exactly. Now the Big Bang Theory is out of, you know, I mean, you can't use that because it's yeah. really not working. That's why when people say, you know, the Bible isn't a science textbook, it's like, oh, well, thank God, because there's, <laughs> science textbooks are always changing. <laughs> but the Word of God never changes, and That's it's always right. true. You know, when my dad went to a Pittsburgh, uh, you know, uh, dinosaur place, uh, they said to him, whatever you learned about dinosaurs, Forget all of it. We're going to tell you everything new now. And he told me that he thought about that, how many times he had heard that from people and, uh, and from scientists and so on. I said, yeah, that's interesting mm -hmm. because they keep changing everything. The Bible doesn't change. Right. And the Bible has always been consistent. And I love that. That is excellent. <laughs> yeah. Corey, you mentioned something I have to talk about. And that's just real briefly the Caiaphas thing, mm -hmm. the Caiaphas Orcerarium. What an amazing thing that was. We saw that. We did, yeah. We Every went, once in a while it'll go on, it'll go on tour, uh, museum tours. Um, and, and we were able to see that when it was in Ottawa several years ago, many years ago, actually. Yeah, we were at but, the uh, museum there and we saw that. We saw mm -hmm. the, the Taliban Stella. Yeah, there was a, it was a really good collection. There was a lot of stuff there. Yeah, we and we saw the uh, <clears throat> work with the, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls, Jezebel Seal, yeah. lots and of stuff. The good Amulet. Stuff. With number 624 on it. That was amazing. Yeah, from Ketephinom, yeah. Yeah, real, yeah. real ancient Hebrew writing. Yes. And I thought they were dated to like 750 BC, but it turns out it said there when I saw it was dated to 800 BC. Mm -hmm. Now they're telling us it was more like 850 BC. So I don't know. It's really interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. So those were good mm -hmm. times. Anyway, sorry, we're having a good time. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. Um, so you, are we. You have a question. I do. But before that, I just want to mention, because we keep running yes. out of time, it's that we have an offer that we have offered before. It just has a little bit of a new look, thanks to our wonderful son-in-law Matlock and it is a psalm CD that my friend Jean DeVries and I did together. I read many of the psalms. They're not all 150 on here for sure but they're in three sections, three themes, uh, praise, promise, and protection. Uh, but they're all from the Psalms with Jean playing uh, beautiful piano music underneath. And uh, we, you have, did a great job we have this as a suggested donation, thank you, of $30 if you are able. So this is not a brand new offer. Some of you already have this. So I just want to let you know that it has a new look, but it is an offer that we've done before. A and lot we're calling it the Psalms Collection. The Psalms Collection. It does indeed. I, I know that, you know, we believe that the word of God said in Psalm 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. We believe that the word of God brings healing and help to our lives. And this is this product here that we have has really touched a lot of people who uh, sometimes they can't sleep at nighttime. Sometimes they are, they're sick at home. Sometimes they're in hospital and this has helped a lot of people. So praise God for his word. It's nothing that we've done. It's because of the word of God. Now, getting to the Word of God, here we have the question. Right for your call, from your call. Proverbs 19. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find... Blank. Good, life, or peace. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. 
He who keeps understanding will find good, life, or peace. Okay, and this is a great question, hmm. and I would ask you the question, what is that word? Hmm. What is that word? They're all good they answers. They all fit, <laughs> don't they? They're all good yeah. answers. I know. And, and they're, they're good answers. What do you think? And good answers <laughs> yeah. is a good That's why I said that. They're all <laughs> answer. good answers. So we're thinking... Good. You're thinking good. to go with good? That's, that's what we're thinking. That's good, because it is good. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good. That's Proverbs 19, verse 8. We also have some really good news. And if you haven't caught the last two programs, we want to tell you again, because we're Live so and direct. excited. Right here on so Quick Study Television. take it away, Corey. Well, our family is growing here on Quick Study. I am expecting a baby boy. Yay! Oh my goodness, that is yeah. great. <laughs> great news. That's the very exciting. Yes. The family expands and we're very excited. And Ryan's got Ollie two and a half, and yeah. you've yeah. got baby boy. We don't know the name. Baby boy. Baby boy. Malik and I are thinking of names, so <laughs> we'll let you know eventually. It's when a hard process, here. isn't it? It is a difficult <laughs> process naming a human. An Man. angel didn't yeah. show up I and tell, tell you. you. <laughs> no, I, okay. I wish that'd be so, way easier. <laughs> you shall call his name. Yeah. I'm waiting. Whatever. I mean, I'm waiting. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's anyway, interesting. we are so excited and we're so thankful to the Lord for his blessings. And so mm -hmm. yeah, That's very good. Family. So we wanted to share that with you because you are our extended family. So there you go. Very good. And I want to remind you of something very important. And <laughs> that is, you know, every time we come to this place, I like to share the good news of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Isaiah 42 says his job description, and he says, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He says it there. It's that 700 years before Christ was ever born. And this is the place where God tells us in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he says, before he can tell the difference between good and evil, he will be able to do this. And it's very important that we understand that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins, and he was crucified and brutally killed on the cross. And suddenly, after three days, he rose again. He paid the price for sin, and he rose again to give us the gift of eternal life. If we ask him to come into our heart, we must ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our lives. Do that today.